Dr. Bob and the Good Old Timers, page 150, colon 4. They stressed morning quiet time daily, reading and daily contact. They also told me I had to do something about my alcoholism every day. All right? <clears throat> we get a daily reprieve based solely on the maintenance of our spiritual condition, as it says later on. All right? Listen very carefully to this one. I saved the best for last. It comes from Dr. Bob and the Good Old Timers, page 136, colon 2. The AA members of that time did not consider meetings necessary to maintain sobriety. They simply were desirable. Morning devotion and quiet time, however, were musts. We go to meetings to meet newcomers to work with so we can carry the message in the 12th step. Prayer and meditation is how we become the people. We become the spearhead of God's ever-advancing creation. And when I talk about God, I'm talking about your experience with God, your best friend. And if your God is not your best friend, if you do these 12 prayers and 12 meditations, you will find a God that is your best friend. All right? <clears throat> Flip over to page 84 in your big books. 84 colon 1. We've all heard, I'm sure, of the promises that they talk about in the, in the, the a lot of meetings read them. The, 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 they call them the ninth step promises from 83 and 84 out of the big book. Um, <clears throat> that's just one set of promises, folks. There's promises throughout the book. I, I'm kind of anal. I'm a, kind of an A-type, and I've written hundreds of pages about the big book and studying it. And I wrote up one day all the musts, nevers, have-tos. You know, I put them all into one document. I also put together all the different promises I found in the big book, and there's hundreds and hundreds of them. It's pretty amazing. <clears throat> but on 84 colon 1, it says, Are these extravagant promises? We think not. They are being fulfilled uh, among us, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. They will always materialize if we work for them. Always materialize. But there's a condition to the statement. And every time I come to a con conditional in this book, I have my guys put a square around it. It says they will all materialize if we work for them, which means I have to take some action. There's got to be work for me to get the promises. This is no such thing as a free lunch in Alcoholics Anonymous or Al-Anon. You don't just come in here and sit in a meeting and get this thing by osmosis. What you will get is relief from pain, but you won't have a spiritual awakening. You'll, you, for that hour, you'll feel a little bit better. But when you leave the group, you'll automatically, your, your spiritual maladies start to build and you start thinking forward to your next meeting. I mean, I got to get to a meeting. I got to get to a meeting. I need, I need to get to a meeting. If that's your thought process, you're using your program as a spiritual filling station. You're coming into our meetings and you're taking off some of our spirituality to go back out and try to live life. And very quickly, that tank will run dry. If you have your own relationship with a God of your own understanding, you can plug into that source of power anytime, anywhere. You can do it in the shower. You can do it in the car. You can do it in your cubicle at work. You, know? you can do it in the doctor's office. I had an amazing experience not too long ago. I had slipped and, and hurt my back. All right? I, I was over in London and stepped on some ice and, and uh, fell, and, and I hurt my spine, and I didn't realize it. And we did some x-rays and MRIs, and I'm in the, in the orthopedic surgeon's office a couple months back, and the doctor's telling me, he goes, oh, geez, look at this. You know, your spine shifted over 50% out of alignment with the rest of it, and that's where my brain shut off. I couldn't hear the doctor. And so I did something very uncharacteristic as I put my hand up. And the doctor says, what? I said, hang on a second, doc. I can't hear a word you're saying. And I prayed out loud. I said, God, I need you here. I need you in this room with me so I can face this. Because the first thing that I heard in my head was, your career is gone, you know, and this pain's going to be with you forever that's in your hip. You've got problems, you know. But as soon as I plugged into God, what I heard very clearly was the voice I had heard two hours earlier when I said my prayer and meditation. And I, he says, I got you. Don't worry, I didn't bring you this far. You're okay. I was able then to look at the doctor and said, I said the prayer out loud. And the doctor looked at me and he goes, his jaw was hanging open. He was literally slack jawed. He says, I've never seen anybody do that before. <laughs> I said, welcome to my world, doc. <laughs> you know, and it turns out the doctor was a believer, you know, which was kind of neat because it, it opened up a, a whole neat series of events happened because that doctor and I shared a spiritual experience together in a doctor's office. How cool is that? only because I bring God with me wherever I go, you know? Because it says on page 55, the God of your understanding is deep down within you. He's in every man, woman, and child, which means me and you, by the way. So if God is within you, even when I'm drinking alcohol, I could pick up a glass of booze right now and God is no further away from me than he is right here right now. Yet I feel sometimes like God is the farthest from me, 
Where did he go? He didn't go anywhere. He's still inside knocking. He wants to have this relationship. There's something blocking me. And the whole purpose of the 12 steps and these prayer meditations is to remove the garbage, open the, the clogged drain, take out the hairball of resentment, take out the, the, the grease trap filled fear trap, you know, to open up the channel so that I can hear the voice of God and feel that expression, the God of my understanding. Does that make sense? All right, so let's continue down. So these will materialize if we work for them. This thought brings us to step 10. What thought? The thought of the prayers coming true if I'm willing to do some work. It's a conditional deal. There's no such thing as a free lunch. You can have the most powerful desire to quit drinking. Desire is absolutely of no avail, it says in our book on the top of page 23. It'll come to the point of every alcoholic desire is not enough. So what gets you a chair in a meeting isn't enough to keep you there. It takes more. It's going to take work. What is it going to take? Well, this thought brings us to step 10, which suggests we continue to take personal inventory, basically like a mini daily four step, and we continue to set right new mistakes as we go along. We vigorously commence this way of living as we cleaned up the past. I take guys to prayer meditation when before they're starting on their four step, they're doing 10 and 11 on a daily basis. If you've got this big pile of crap that you've created in your drinking life and from your addiction, let's not create an entire another pile while we're over here, while we're trying to dig this up by doing a fourth and fifth step, because it's going to take some time to dig through a fourth and fifth step. Let's clean the daily stuff up while we work on the ancient history stuff as we go through. So I teach in prayer meditation right out of the get-go. And I've heard people say, well, wait a minute. You can't talk about God with a newcomer. You'll scare him off. Guess what? Alcohol will scare him right back. I'm not worried about that. My job, according to this book, is to lay the spiritual toolkit at their feet. If they want what I have and they're desperate enough to get it, they have the gift of desperation, they'll pick up the spiritual toolkit. If nothing else, I plant the seed. And when they go out there, they can't successfully drink anymore because they know the truth. And eventually, if they live, they'll make it back in here. But I digress. <clears throat> All right? This is not an overnight matter. It should continue for a lifetime. And here comes the next thing. It says, continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. I've worked with one word in Alcoholics Anonymous for over 20 years, folks. Watch. What does it look like to watch? I'm watching for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. It says, when these crop up, it doesn't say if these crop up, they're going to crop up. And if you haven't had a resentment in a week, guess what? You're going through life asleep thinking you're awake. They're there. But we're tremendous at, at pushing those things down into Pandora's box. If it doesn't trig, peg the meter, we figure, hey, I got it okay. But there's still this low-grade agitation that starts our day, and we're just kind of crabby and, uh, you know, that everybody's shaking their heads. You know the gnawing kind of, ah, uh, you get in your life? Guess what's motivating that? That's fear-based resentment. It's in your life. And it gives us a set of instructions. When these crop up, we ask God. There's another square. We're at our second prayer. We ask God to, at once to remove them, right? That here comes your instructions. There's four instructions. First piece is we ask God to remove them. We discuss them with someone immediately. Sometimes it's the person that you got upset with. You know, I could be sitting there in, at 7-Eleven, right? And the person's going too slow. The lady that was in front that wanted to count the change out of her purse. And now I'm in this state of agitation. I've got this little mini resentment. And I'm up and I'm starting to be short with the 7-Eleven clerk. And I'm thinking... Come on, I just want that lottery ticket and pay my gas bill. Give me the, hurry up. And I'm starting to act short and I can catch myself if I'm watching. And I see myself in that behavior and that's not the man I want to be today. So I'll stop myself and I'll go, oh, excuse me, ma'am, I'm sorry. I, I'm just having a bad day. What did I just do there? I shared it with someone immediately. I shared it with the person I was being mean to. I fulfilled the second requirement. I don't necessarily have to run and get on my phone and call my sponsor and say, you're not going to believe what I just did at 7-Eleven. <laughs> If I have to, I will, or I'll call anybody that's in this room and say, hey, I just screwed up. Here's what I have to do about it. But anybody, any other human being, I got to get out of the, you've heard me say it this morning, I got to get out of the itty bitty shitty committee. The, the voices that are in my head, that's, if I'm thinking about it, I'm behind enemy lines. Because on the top of page 23, it says the problem centers in our mind. So guess what, folks? You have to be out of your mind to find God. You cannot think your way through, through Alcoholics Anonymous or Al-Anon. You have to experience it, and you go through these prayers and meditations to seek power outside of yourself, and the reality is the power is inside of yourself. It's deep down within, and you're just blocked off from it. You've got to remove the block, all right? 
So we ask God at once to remove it, we, that which means a prayer. We discuss it with someone else immediately. We make amends quickly if we've harmed anyone. So I apologize to the 7-Eleven clerk. And then we resolutely turn our thoughts to someone we can help. That's the hard piece. Who can I help? So very often, if I've been that way, I'll look at the 7-Eleven clerk and I'll say, you know, I thought I was having a bad day. How are you doing? Are you okay? I had that experience with the coffee lady over there. She provided me great service, and she gave me a cup of coffee, and she made the correct change, and I gave her a tip in the, in the cup, and I'm filling up my coffee cup, and I looked at her, and she had this weird look in her face, and I listened to the still small voice, and I said, how are you doing today? And she's like, I'm doing fine. Now, I hadn't done anything wrong, so I wasn't doing this particular thing, but I was bothering to pay attention to somebody outside of myself, a very unalcoholic behavior, you know? I mean, it's, <laughs> normally it's all about us, right? And she says, I'm doing fine. I said, you know, you guys provide us with great service, and if nobody's told you, thank you very much for your service today. This has been a great experience at this hotel. Everybody here has been very professional. Thank you. And you could just see her. She kind of puffed right up, and she says, well, thank you for saying that. I made the world a little better place because I was in it and I was sober today, right? So it's easy to do once you learn how to do this. I just have a lot of experience with this because I screw up a lot. <laughs> Maybe you guys don't. <laughs> All right? Then we resolutely turn our thoughts to someone we can help. Love and tolerance of others is our code. That's in a very powerful statement. Love and tolerance of others is our code. Huge, right? There's a whole bunch more of, of these prayers and meditations. We don't have time to cover them all, but I do want to cover one on page 85. Let's look at the next piece. 85 colon 1. It is easy to let up on the spiritual program of action and rest on our, uh, and rest on our laurels. We are headed for trouble if we do, for alcohol is a subtle foe. We are not cured of alcoholism. What we really have is a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of our meetings. No. Maintenance of our talking to our sponsor. No. Maintenance of our spiritual condition. Every day. Wait a minute. Did they just say every day? Every day is a day when we must. Wait a minute. I thought there were no musts in, in recovery. There's a lot of musts. Every day is a day when we must carry the vision of God's will into all of our activities. Do you think they really meant all of our activities? Yeah, they meant all of our activities. That's the deal. There's the vision, prayer, meditation, and vision. It's right out of the book. All right? Let's go to the top of page 86. All right? We know the book in our recovery program gives us a whole bunch of inventories to do, right? We're supposed to have our formal four-step, our formal inventory. Then we have what they call the spot check inventory, and they have the daily inventory. We've all, I'm sure you've probably all heard of those things. If you haven't, read, read the, the Alcoholics Anonymous 12 by 12, the 12 Steps and 12 Traditions, and it covers it pretty well. Look at 86 colon 1. It says, when we retire at night. Well, one of the things I did is I wanted to go back and do what the first 100 were doing. So I went back and read the original multilith that they, before they printed this big book, they wrote out a, a text and they sent it around to doctors and got some feedback. And it didn't say when we retire at night. You know what it actually said is? It says when you awake in the morning, look back over the day before. So if you look at our history, those quotes that I read to you, what were they doing? They were doing prayer and meditation in the morning to get a vision to carry through the day to be a better human being. So that's what I do today, is I do this in the morning. And this next paragraph, there's 12 questions that were asked here, and I've written them out for you on the back of your sheet, right? Was I resentful, right? The book says, were we resentful, selfish, dishonest, and afraid? There's four questions right there, and I've given you the instructions. If I was resentful, the big book gives us a four-column inventory, right? We write out the first three columns, and then on page 67, there is a 12 P, you notice I like the, word, this, the 12 number, 12 steps, 12 tradition, 12 concepts. Here's 12 questions. On page 67, everybody go to page 67. I'll even show it to you. <clears throat> Not 76, I'm dyslexic today. 67, right? Page 67, we're between column three and column four as the big book gives it to us, right? It says, though we did not like their symptoms, that's what we put into column two, is their symptoms, what they did that bothered us, or the way it disturbed us, what, what, the way they disturbed us is what's in column three, right? From, from inventory. Uh, they, like ourselves, were sick too. We asked God. So this is a prayer, right? We're asking God to help us show them the same. Here comes number one. I'm just going to count through the numbers. You're going to have to stick with me. Tolerance is number one. Pity is number two. Patience is number three. That we cheerfully, cheerfulness. There's number four. Grant a sick friend. Friend. What do we do for our friends? 
we give them leeway. But remember, we're writing inventory. We're treating them like they're some SOB that should burn in hell. No, this is telling me I'm supposed to be praying for them like a friend. I'm going to give them some, some slack. I'm going to give them some grace that we would give a friend. Uh, if that person offended, we said to ourselves, this is a sick man. How can I be helpful to him? There's another prayer, right? There's number six. God save me from angry. There's number seven. Thy will be done. There's number eight. Avoid retaliation. There's number nine. Argument number 10. We wouldn't treat sick people that way. We, if we do, we destroy our chance of being helpful. We cannot be helpful to all people, but at least God will show us. Wait a minute. God's going to show us. There's your vision. He's going to show us how to take a kindly, there's number 11, kindness, and tolerant view of each and every one. Tolerant view is number 12. But wait a minute. Number one is tolerance, and number 12 is tolerant view. What's the difference? I like to use an example, and it's kind of gross, but I'm going to use it anyway. Let's say my buddy is a, is a nose picker. He, he's always picking his nose when he's talking to you, right? Because he's my friend, I'll tolerate the fact that he picks his nose. Because I like him, so I put up with the fact. Tolerance is something I put up with. Yet in my mind, when I think of him, my friend, let's call him Joe, I think of Joe, I think of him as a nose picker. If I have a tolerant view, I think of him as a sick child of God. I give him grace and compassion. So I no longer think I put up with the behavior, but I have to change my attitude towards him, my view of him, and have a tolerant view. Does that make sense, the difference between tolerance and tolerant view? So there's 12 pieces for this prayer. This is called a forgiveness prayer. We say this prayer between column three and column four over inventory, right? So let's go back to page 86 where we were. It says, when we retire at night, well, we, when we wake in the morning for us, were we resentful? If I was resentful, I write out a four-column inventory, which means I really quickly write out who's in column one, what he did to me in column two, how it affected me in column three, and then I take those 12 pieces and I say a prayer for this person that I'm angry with. It can't not soften your heart. Only after I've softened my heart do I look at the four questions in column four. Where was I being selfish? Where was I self-seeking? Where was I dishonest? And where was I afraid? And when I boil that down, I come up with a fear. And I have a fear tool from page 68 that the big book gave me. And I can go give the fear tool to God. You know, give the fear. And it says, at once I outgrow fear. Fear is what's blocking the channel between me and God at that moment. I'm expressing it as anger. Anytime you see somebody that's angry, anger is always a secondary emotion. It's never a primary emotion. Something's making you get angry. And 99.9% .9 of the time for this alcoholic, it's fear. We are fear generators. All right? So... <clears throat> I, there's a pretty good explanation here. So take these through and go through and read these paragraphs. One of the things that Carl taught me is don't ever let anybody read your big book for you. All I'm doing is pointing you to the big book. That's why I wrote the sheet. Now, don't use just the sheet. The sheet is the finger pointing to what you're supposed to be using. You know, if you're focused on the finger, you're focused on the wrong thing. Go to the book yourself. Take this sheet and use it as a guide to lead you through the book and have your own experience. Ask yourself the questions. What does this mean to me? If you see a conditional, if you see the word if, it means there's a condition for that to happen. Some of the times it's double conditionals. Sometimes it says if this and that. I put a square around the word and because if I want this, I have to do this, but I also have to do that. If I just do this, I don't get what I want because half measures avail me nothing. And I think that's actually, I'll digress for just a second. It's one of the expressions in the big book. If Bill Wilson were alive, I'd ask him, I'd talk to him about it. Because it's very, in chapter five, in how it works, it talks about half measures avail us nothing. I don't believe that. Half measures don't get you half. You know what half measures get you? Sicker. You do this program halfway and watch what happens. Because you don't have alcohol to depend upon. All you've got is the resentment and all the nasty emotions, and you don't have any way to put the flames out. And you become a royal pain in the backside. I'll try to watch my words today. You know? So I don't think Bill Wilson was, I think he was meaning something different, but half measures don't avail us half. They get you sicker. You don't get nicks, nay, bunk, a bub kiss, squat. You don't get diddly. You get sicker. All right? So I digress. So give this a shot. That's the, the, the 12 prayers and 12 meditations that I wanted to talk about. Some people have never meditated before. All right, so I wanted to talk about meditation for a second. And meditations, there's nothing fancy about meditation. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Um, <clears throat> all meditation means is to get into the present moment. Because in the Far East tradition, they talk about the chatter of a thousand monkeys gets in your head. And that's the, what I describe as the itty bitty shitty committee, you know, and you get all these little voices. And I've actually 
named my voices, you know. Uh, I've got the judge, you know, the judge is always there. The judge, the jury, and the executioner. The judge is the one that judges it. He hands it off to the jury. The jury co-signs the behavior, and then the executioner tries to figure out how I'm going to get even with you, right? If I can't get even with you right then, then all of a sudden I bring in a fourth character called the hitman. And the hitman will wait. He'll lie and wait for years until I can give payback, you know, if I'm in my sick state, you know. There's a banker up there. There's, there's Romeo up there. Romeo thinks that he's God's gift to women, you know. He was the 13th stepper when I first got sober. You know, there's the spiritual man. There's the sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous who wants to be the sage in the group who doesn't want to be the bleeding deacon. But if he doesn't get his way in, in his group, watch him throw a little temper tantrum in my mind, right? And by the way, if you go to a group and there's people that know that group because of it's, oh, that's Joe Blow's group, get away from it. Anytime you have a group around one person, there's something wrong with that group. We let God speak through the group conscience. No group should be anybody's group. It should be our group. But that's my own little sidetrack. So how do you get into the present moment? You know, most of us know when we're out of the present moment because the hamster's on the wheel. The chatter of a thousand monkeys going off and all of a sudden your mind goes and says, oh, I got to get this done. I got to get the taxes done. I got to, oh, I got to go pick up groceries. Oh, I forgot my dry cleaning. Whatever it happens to be, it's in there. And if you've never had that, you're in the wrong room, first of all. <clears throat> Second of all, the way you test yourself is not in the morning, it's at night. When you lay your head on the pillow, if you can't immediately fall asleep, you get the chatter of a thousand monkeys, something's wrong with your spiritual condition. My wife will tell you, she's sitting right over there, you can ask her, when I hit the, hit the pillow, sometimes she'll be in mid-sentence and I'm already asleep. I don't stay awake at night with the chatter of a thousand monkeys because I do this work, all right? Well, what's the, one of the quickest ways to get into the present moment is to do something that we all do something, somewhere between 17,000 and 23,000 times a day. Breathe. Just breathe. Faith Hill is one of the greatest spiritual teachers I've had in a lot of years with that song of hers, Just Breathe. Sometimes that's what it comes down to. When I get all worked up and I call my spiritual guy and I say, hey, you're not going to believe what's going on, he'll go, Dave, take a breath. And then he'll remind me, what I want doesn't matter. If you're interested, I've got some stickers up here. After the meeting, you can come up. It says, what I want doesn't matter. Uh, <clears throat> it's, a, it's kind of a joke, but I put those. I needed that kind of visual reminder all throughout the day. What I want doesn't matter. I don't get a vote. Guys will call me and they'll tell me, oh, Dave, I got this problem. And they'll tell me the problem. And I'll go, whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. Did you find a vote around your house someplace? Because you don't get a vote. I'm sorry. Something's wrong here. Like, oh, you're right, you're right. You know, if nothing else, I always use the expression, be where your feet are. If you have to, lean forward and look down at your feet. We're right here in this room right now. If the chatter is trying to take you to work or to lunch or to dinner tonight or to the meeting you're chairing in an hour, you're not in the present moment. You're missing God. The only place you can find God is right here, right now. God will be in the future, but you can't go into the future yet because it's not the present. So you can't connect with God in the future. And God is no longer in the past. And if your mind's in the past, you're not in the present moment. That's what our ego, you know, Harry Tebow, I talked about him earlier. That's the job of your ego, is to get you out of the present moment. And the way it does that, it goes into the past. It takes some bad experience. Then it projects it in the future. Is Watch out. This is going to happen. And guess what it just did? Very creatively, it hopscotched right over the present moment. And you're no longer the only, in the only place you can connect to your power greater than yourself, the present moment. So the goal is just to get back to the present moment. One of the easiest tools, like I said, is breathing. We do it thousand times a day, thousands and thousands of times a day. But how, mo how often do we actually think about our breath? We don't. So everybody sit up in your chairs, all right? <clears throat> Put your feet squarely on the floor and be comfortable, all right? And imagine a string coming out the top of your head. Somebody just pulls you up really quickly and then lets you down. And what I like to say is relax with dignity so that you're not hyperextending your spine. You just want to relax with dignity. And if you're like me and you've got a little roly-poly around the front, Nobody, nobody will look, I promise. Just pick it up and get it up over the top of the belt because we're going to breathe. We don't want anything restricting our breath, all right? Hand position. You've got two different, really, there's a whole bunch of different ways. You can have your palms up. From the Oriental traditions, if your palms up, you're open. You're allowing God to send stuff to you. You're, you're receiving because that's the position we do when we reach our hands out. We're open. If you turn your hands over, then you're not asking for something. You're just kind of sitting there and you're, you're content, you're looking into yourself with your hands over. Some people will lay their hands open to each other and they'll touch their thumbs as if they're cupping like a little egg or something between their hands. 
just so that they have something to do with their hands. All I care about is that you relax. I don't care whether up, down, left, right, just relax. I don't want any stress or any tension in your hands, all right? And, and what I want you to do is to take two deep breaths into what's called the tantien in, Japanese, in the Japan tradition. It's two inches below your belly button and two inches deep. So you're not going to breathe up in your chest, which we all tend to do when we get stressed. Most people in addiction breathe from the top of their chest. I want you to breathe into your belly, all right? So when I do it, I'm going to say, take two deep breaths really quickly, you know, a normal pace, but I want them to be controlled. This is the first thing I want you to do is going to be controlled so you have some control to start with. And then after that, just let your breath go and just see if you can experience it. You'll notice that when we started this, we burned a little sage and it, it, it irritated some people. Everybody said, what is that? You know what I did? I brought every one of you into this room with that sage. Because you smelt it and you went, wow, you weren't in the hamster. You were here. You were right here right now. Whether you liked the smell, whether you didn't like the smell, it brought you right here. I'm going to use a chime. See if you can hear the chime and how long you can hear the chime to bring you to the center, center moment. So what I'm going to ask you to do is take your two breaths, then listen to the chime, then I'm going to sit down. And we're just going to be quiet for, I don't know, 30, 60 seconds. We'll see. And we'll go from there. Okay? Everybody got the instructions? All right. Two breaths. Two breaths. 